We welcome you all to church this morning on this rather blustery but sunny spring day and to those of you uh, listening or tuning in online. Our service today is conducted by our worship leaders, Simon, Marion and Patricia, and I now hand over to them. Good morning. We, Simon, Marion and I, welcome you to our service this morning. We may not all be gathered in the same building, but we do need each other so much. We're invited to worship together from wherever we are, knowing that God can hear us all and can blend even distant voices into one song of worship. Our call of worship is Psalm 133, which will be on the screen. If you can join in with the, the bold type, and there will be a, call to, a second call to worship following on. Behold, how good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, even on Aaron's beard, running down upon the collar of his clothing. It is like the dew of Hermon, running down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has promised his blessing, even life for everyone. Let us gather with hearts united, drawn together by the bonds of faith and the spirit of unity. May we worship be a reflection of this fellowship and unity, where no one claimed private ownership, but all things were held in common. In this sacred moment, <clears throat> let us open our hearts to the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, who moves among us, binding us together in love. <clears throat> we come not as individuals alone, but as a community where the needs of one are met by the abundance of the other. Let our worship be a symphony of selfless love, echoing the chorus of the early believers, testifying to the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Together, let us worship in unity, offering our hearts, minds, bodies, souls and possessions, knowing that in our shared devotion, we encounter the presence of the risen Christ, one body, one family, gathered in love. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Let Us Build a House. It was written by the American writer Marty Hogan and was first published in 1984. Let Us Build a House, if you're using a hymn book, it's number 409. Peace and justice meet. 
as the Acts of the Apostles, is the continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Traditionally attributed to the physician Luke, a companion of the Apostle Paul, Acts provides a detailed account of the early days of the Christian Church, chronicling the events that unfolded after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The book spans a period of approximately three decades, capturing the journey of the disciples, the spread of the gospel, the birth of the early Christian community, and the remarkable activities of key figures such as Peter and Paul. Acts not only serves as a historical record, but also explores the theological foundations of the Christian faith. Themes such as divine intervention, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the enduring mission of the church. Interestingly, the author does not try to make everything appear wonderful and includes examples of the many difficulties, differences of opinion, and struggles that the fledgling church encountered. The passage this week that we're going to read, however, is not looking at the negatives, but it's emphasizing the positive attributes of the early church, with believers being described as having one heart and mind, sharing everything they had and caring for one another. The theme here focuses on the unity of believers and the generosity that flowed from their deep sense of community. This theme of unity was also found in Psalm 133, which we read at the beginning of this service. And now someone is going to read <laughs> Acts 4. Verses 32 to 35. Thank you. <laughs> Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. The believers share their possessions. 
All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Thank you, Kath. For each of the readings today, we have a little bit you might like to ponder on. Not necessarily right this minute, but if you can remember, you could select one of the, the three and think about it this week, one for each reading. How can we, and the one for this reading, is how can we as a community find ways to receive what we need or to share what we have within the church today? And now let us draw closer to God with a prayer of praise. Let us pray. Creator God, as we come before you in prayer, our hearts overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving for the precious gift of unity and fellowship. Thank you, Father, for the harmonious symphony created when we, your children, live for each other, no matter our differences. In our diversity, you weave a tapestry of love, understanding and compassion, echoing the beauty of your kingdom on earth. As we reflect on the goodness of unity, we offer our thanksgiving for the moments of laughter, hope, happiness, togetherness, of comfort, of strength and the ability to share the weight of our burdens, which is found in genuine fellowship. Your presence among us, Lord, brings harmony to our gatherings and peace and joy to our hearts. May our gratitude be expressed not only in words, but also in our actions towards one another. Empower us to love sincerely, to forgive readily, and to bear each other's burdens willingly. Embodying the harmony that the word we heard today celebrates. Thank you, Lord, for the precious gift of unity, a gift that reflects the essence of your nature. We are grateful for the fellowship we share as brothers and sisters in Christ, bound together by the love that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer of gratitude and thanksgiving. Amen. And now let us share in the prayer that the Lord himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And in that heart of praise, our next hymn is Give me joy in my heart, keep me praising. 
It's number 76 in the hymn books if you're using them. reading we find two pivotal moments in the aftermath of Jesus resurrection the first scene unfolds on the evening of the resurrection day the disciples fearing the authorities have locked themselves in a room suddenly Jesus appears in their midst greeting them with the reassuring words peace be with you in the second scene, we have the story of Thomas, one of the disciples who was absent during this encounter. When informed of Jesus' appearance, he expressed doubt, declaring that unless he saw and touched the wounds, he would not believe. Many of us can place ourselves in Thomas's sandals. The passage encapsulates themes of doubt, faith, transformative power of encountering the risen Christ. It emphasized the importance of faith that goes beyond mere physical appearance and evidence. Perhaps over the coming week, after you've listened to the reading, you might want to ponder a couple of things. What does it mean to have faith? And what does it mean to have doubt? Charles will now read the passage for us. Thank you, Charles. John chapter 20, 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Thank you, Charles. Now for our prayer of confession, let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we come before you with humble hearts, acknowledging the doubts that linger within us and the moments when our faith wavers. In the stillness of this space, we confess our shortcomings and seek your forgiveness. Like the disciples in that locked room, we sometimes find ourselves paralyzed by fear, fear of the unknown, fear of inadequacy, fear of the challenges that lie ahead. In these moments, we may have doubted your presence and questioned your plans for us. Forgive us for the times when we've struggled to fully trust in your power. Forgive us for the moments when we've allowed doubt to overshadow the profound truth of your victory over death. In the spirit of Thomas, we confess there are times when we demand tangible evidence, seeking assurance that we can see and touch, rather than trusting in the unseen reality of your love and grace. We repent of our limited vision and ask for the faith to believe without always needing to see. May the same spirit that breathes space into the locked room breathe forgiveness and renewal into our hearts today. Empower us to go forth with courage, sharing the good news of your resurrection and embodying the love that casts out fear. We offer this prayer in the name of the risen Christ, who continues to transform doubt into faith and darkness into light. Amen. Our next hymn is The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free. It was written by Damien Lundy, who was born in Sowerby Bridge in Yorkshire, and he became a religious brother of the De La Salle Order in the 1960s. He's widely respected as a leading innovator in many forms of Christian ministry and education in the UK. Our offertory will be taken during this hymn and it's hymn 397 if you're using a hymn book. The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free.
Our next reading is 1 John 1. Verse 1 to 1 John, 1 John 2, 1 John 1, chapter 2, verse 2. Sorry. In the opening verses of this passage, John sets the tone for the entire epistle. The author is traditionally believed to be the Apostle John. And it begins with a declaration about the nature of Jesus Christ. This introduction emphasizes the reality of Christ's existence from the beginning, highlighting both his divine nature and his human presence here on earth. It also focuses on the importance of fellowship, the themes of light and darkness, confession of sin, the advocacy of Jesus, and the practical implications of genuine faith. The letter challenges believers to be authentic lives, or to live authentic lives. Deeply rooted in the truth of the gospel and characterized by love, obedience, and discernment. And now I'll hand you over to Alan to read that passage for us. So our third reading is 1 John verse sorry, chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 2. The word of life. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of the Lord. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. God is light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Christ our Advocate. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father and Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Thank you, Alan. For this passage, you might like to ponder over the coming week. How can we get the balance right between belief and lifestyle? And what are some ways in which Christians can shine as God's light in the world? 
and keeping that idea of God's light in our minds. Our next hymn is number 59. We tend to know it as Shine, Jesus Shine. But it's also known as its first line, by its first line, Lord, the light of your love. It's a Christian praise song written in 1987 by Graham Kendrick. And the song was voted 10th in a 2005 survey of the United Kingdom's favourite hymns by the BBC's Songs of Praise programme. So let us sing, Shine Jesus Shine. <laughs> recordings and seeing whose voices you can pick out. Mercifully, I'm not on any of them. I'm going to have our prayers of intercession now. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we lift our hearts in prayer, we intercede on behalf of your beloved children, recognizing the challenges and joys that shape our shared journey of faith. We pray for those who, like the disciples, 
may be wrestling with doubt or fear. May the light of your truth dispel the shadows, bringing reassurance and peace. Strengthen their faith and grant them the courage to walk boldly in your light. Lord, we intercede for those burdened by the weight of unconfessed sins. May the spirit of confession and repentance bring healing and restoration. Shower them with the assurance of your forgiveness, cleansing them from all unrighteousness. We lift up those who long for genuine fellowship within the community of believers. May your spirit foster unity, understanding and love, creating a bond that reflects the beauty of the fellowship the early church aspired to. May our shared life be a testimony to the transformative power of your grace. We intercede for those who feel isolated or lonely, yearning for connection. Wrap them in the warmth of your love and guide us to be instruments of companionship and support. May we actively seek out those in need and extend the hand of friendship. Lord, we bring before you the broken relationships within our communities. Heal wounds, reconcile hearts, and inspire forgiveness. May the love that binds us together overcome any discord, and may our unity reflect the unity found in your triune nature. We pray for those facing adversity, illness, or distress. Embrace them with your comforting presence and grant them the strength to endure. Use us, your church, as channels of your love, bringing practical help and compassion to those in need. In our intercession, we remember those who have not yet encountered the fullness of your light. Illuminate their hearts and minds, drawing them into the fellowship of believers. May our lives be living testimonies inviting others into the transformative relationship found in Christ. And now, Lord, we bring before you the names and situations that lie heaviest in our hearts. Lord, as we intercede for these needs, we place our trust in your boundless love and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I had a slightly sweaty and clammy start to this morning when I thought I'd lost the document where I'd written down what I was going to say, and then I was faced with the choice between extemporising or trying to scribble it all down again in the next ten minutes, and then fortunately I found it and God was good again. We've been thinking this morning about early Christian communities, and it made me think of different communities that I'd been a part of, and so a few recaps, but don't worry, not my whole life story year by year. I suppose like most of us, the first community that I remember is the one I grew up in. It was a small village, which is quite a bit bigger now, and the street hasn't changed much. My parents are still living in the same house I grew up in, where they've been for more than 50 years. The couple next door are still there as well after all that time, as are the couple two doors down, and quite a few more. I was back in the village last summer to go to a funeral of one of the other neighbours of this seemingly forever community. I found out via their son on Facebook that his mother had passed away. Whilst expressing my sympathy with him, I wrote that when we were playing football, riding bikes, and generally living a carefree life while growing up, we just assumed that community would last forever. But of course, communities like that don't last forever. People move away for different reasons, and of course, sadly, they pass away. And so over time, they just come to a natural end in the way that we've known them. Next obvious one for me was school. 
It seemed a good school at the time, although I don't think they were subject to all the sort of rigorous analysis that schools are constantly uh, subject to nowadays. We had very few comings and goings in our class through the year, six years or so that we were in primary school, so we all knew each other as a class. But obviously school comes to a natural end. You have to grow up and leave and go all the way to secondary school, which for most people in the village was about two miles down the road, but myself and a handful of my classmates followed our older siblings in going to the local Welsh-speaking secondary school uh, where we formed a new community. But of course those things come to an end, they're age constrained. I was back in the village a couple of weeks ago doing a little uh, favour for my parents and they knocked my primary school down. I couldn't believe they'd demolished the mighty Penaforth County Primary and sold out to Abbots Lane just down the other end of the village. A thoroughly shameful episode. And then there was university, the first time living independently away from home for a prolonged period of time. That was a good way of forming a community in an impromptu fashion. In our case, there were eight of us thrown together in a flat in university-managed halls. Some from overseas, different religions, all in our little shared space. And for most of the time, we got on well enough. And then there were the fellow students on the course. We spent a lot of time with them in lectures, laboratory sessions, and then in the last few months in particular, in the library from dawn till dusk, frantically swatting up in those old fashioned things called books, in a real pressure cooker environment for final exams. And then one day, perhaps after that last exam or on graduation day, we were all just standing around when it was all over and just casually said to each other, well, I'll see you then, as we went our separate ways. We probably expected that we would, but in reality, we never really did. It was strange in that pre-Facebook era because for the earlier years at school, uh, you had the obvious connection of it being in your home. Families were still there, parents and families, and so you'd still see school friends around when you were back and parents would pass on news of other goings on to uh, other school families. But at uni, where people were from all over the place and indeed overseas, there was no obvious reason to bump into them again. So we just drifted away without really thinking about it three years of friendship, fellowship and community just melting away. After a few years of my first postgraduate job, I joined a very small specialist firm who were based in the Netherlands and did work all over Europe. Three or four of us ended up working for them for a Swiss bank in Zurich in Switzerland. Though it was just the three or four of us from the, our company, it was a boom time for banks and they were employing a lot of other external staff who weren't actually natives. Some flew in and out on Monday to Friday, others would stick around for weekends or different periods of time as well. But we all had the freedom and flexibility to be able to do that work away. We were all young, free and single, overpaid and over there. We worked together and actually the bank certainly got what they were paying for. Uh, they didn't put up with slackers and uh, it was uh, serious work. But when the work was over for the day, there wasn't really anything to do or anyone to do it with, except those same people you've been working with. So we'd go out for food, drinks, films at the cinema, concerts, whatever wild away the time. And it was another community to be part of, not exactly our Fuida Saint pet for people who might have seen the program. Uh, the accommodation was better for starters. Um, but we were together all the time, living a good life away from home. But it was just another community that came to an end. People moved on for other jobs or their bit of the project finished. And for me, I came back home because there were some other people I wanted to spend my time with. I even married one of them. So village life, growing up, school, university, careers, all those little communities came and went. And that brings us to the what, this one, where we all are today, here at Frodsham Methodist Church, in community with each other and other Christians in Frodsham and all over the world. How's this community, Methodism for hundreds of years on this spot, and Christianity for thousands of years all over the world, lasted the way it has when all these other communities come and go? And the answer is that this community has something that others don't, that solid invitation from God to know him, to be unconditionally loved and forgiven. The events of those three decades from Acts that Marion talked about at the beginning, they still carry on now. 
because the things that forge that early community are still relevant and God is still present. The mission of the church continues and we are the beneficiaries of that while simultaneously being the ones entrusted to carry it on. Long may this community continue to have one heart and mind rooted in the same truths that the earliest apostles experienced and to walk in the light. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 687, entitled One Human Family. The hymn was written by the Reverend Rosemary Wakelin, a Methodist minister who never quite managed to retire. By the age of seven, she says she already knew she wanted to be a minister. At the time, she had to be told by her mother that they don't have ladies. It wasn't until after her husband Paul died in 1979 that she took up the call to ordained ministry having already spent many years as a missionary wife and teacher. With Paul, a doctor, Rosemary worked as a mission partner in Sierra Leone and then in Kenya in the wake of the Mau Mau uprising. It was sometimes difficult because there would be ex-Mau Mau members who would still be carrying guns. They'd flag me down when I would drive once a week 40 miles to Miru to pick up supplies and I'd give lifts to soldiers with three kids and a dash hound also in the car. Back in the UK and making a long, slow recovery from amoebic hepatitis, Rosemary and Paul settled down in Norfolk. Paul as a GP, Rosemary as a teacher. First at a hospital with children living with Down syndrome and then in state schools. Just before Paul died, he said to Rosemary, at last, you're going to be free to do what you've always wanted to do. To become a minister, which she did at the same year as her eldest son, Mark, president of the Methodist Conference in 2012 and 2013. On the cusp of retirement in Norwich, she took up a new challenge to be the Methodist chaplain at a prison for sex offenders in the city. She discovered that as a, quote, a small, defense, completely defenseless woman, she's just five foot two, you alter the chemistry of the place when you go in. And she's made relationships that she thought would be more difficult for a man. She says of the prisoners, they're not just their crime, and a lot of them are grown-up, abused children. She's found herself enacting that fundamental belief described in this hymn. One human family God has made, and all for each to care. Hymn number 687. <coughs> Oh, 